Hello all and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I'll give it 30 more seconds for any uh, additional latecomers to, to join us um, on, on this fire chat webinar. Um, but yeah, thank you to all those that, that have joined us so far. Um, I think I've just got the thumbs up from Krista, so uh, we'll we'll get going. Um, look, welcome um, everyone, as I just said, to today's webinar, which is talking about, you know, industry specific around um, legal firms um, and some of the challenges we have in terms of moving from what's very traditional client MI reporting um, to, to more of a modern kind of insights and analytics around case management and how does that drive value for all, for legal firms customers um, and how does how does what role does data science um, and the emergence of AI have to have to play in that um, and practically how do we go about about putting that in um, so it on the call today it's going to be a bit of a fireside chat um, a, an open discussion um, around those topics uh, slightly guided by by those topics that we've we've put out through the webinar um, that we'll discuss in a moment but um, on the call we've got myself uh, so I I work for Eden Smith Eden Smith we're a data staffing and consulting specialist uh, we work with a number of customers across different industries to support their data transformation um, and to help them guide through a sustainable and, and future proofing of their data journey um, and, and their data maturity uh, joining me uh, at the fireside I've got Austin King uh, Austin is a global head of data and analytics he's been in the data space for, for a number of years now uh, um, a couple of different industries. Um, I'll let him introduce himself from that. Um, but for the last few years, has been with a global legal firm um, that uh, has, has seen quite a rapid transformation. So, um, Austin, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, um, yeah, if you just want to give uh, give the, the the people on the call just a bit of a an intro around yourself, your your experience in data, and and kind of what brought you to where we are today. Oh, OK, uh, thank you. Um, so I've I've been in kind of data management for I, I guess I've been saying 25 years for probably the last five years. So it's probably getting you know teetering on 30 years now um, in enterprise uh, data management. Um, in that time, I've gone through a number of different industries um, from uh, media uh, uh, business um, through to financial services, um, through to legal services. Um, I, it's what the consistent um, element has always been the fact that I've always been involved in the uh, the, the data management. Um, I, I've, I've kind of lived through certainly in the financial um, uh, period, the establishment of um, the CDO and the rise of the CDO, um, which I think you know largely was uh, as a result of um, the, um, the kind of credit crunch and, uh, and um, uh, recession back in 2008. I believe it um, around that time. Um, yes, yeah, certainly for the last um, four years, I've been uh, responsible for the establishment um, of an enterprise data and kind of, uh, um, uh, platform and um, a move to the cloud um, and uh, data enablement um, uh, in a legal firm. And, and I think that uh, I put out in the in the post today about the fact that it's always great to talk about industry specifics. I think no matter what industry we work within, um, the, the, the data problems and the data culture problems are are the same across organisations, but with, with various in different little flavours. Um, I think the legal industry is one that that historically has been seen as quite slow to respond and and you know um not keeping up there although i feel that we've had some um uh, some surgeons in the last couple of years with a couple of the big players from from that side um uh, but with the legal firms we've worked with um and and worked with you, the pleasure working with yourself austin there's there's still this this entrapment of traditional client management insights you know management information mi reporting um and today we want to take that conversation to, to BI, to, to insights, to analytics. For you, what's the what's the difference between, you know, MI, BI, insights and analytics? Well, I guess, yeah, you, you're, you're right. And certainly it's, it's a, a significant um, uh, element of what the firm does is the, the, the client uh, management information reporting um, is, is fairly um, high intensive, um, highly intensive, um, uh, work that goes into purely just reporting on what what's happened um, in the case, predominantly in the kind of um, matters of uh, cases. So it's a very kind of granular or ta tabular um, in, in in its reporting. 
I think the, the the industry itself and certainly the legal firm obviously are kind of you know they're working with their clients. One of the, a big difference between kind of financial of uh, maybe and uh, and um, uh, the, the the legal um, industry and maybe maybe that touches into the insurance industries. Whereas in um, banking, uh, that, that, and certainly um, uh, due to kind of regulations, they, was, they were forced to kind of establish their data exchanges um, electronically um, quite early on and to have everything like um, uh, you know, kind of exchanged digitally. In the legal and um, uh, practices, it seems to be a little bit more um, kind of simplified, um, if I can um, say that way, so that the client MI is purely just you know data sets being sent, sent out. The the move from that into BI and I guess really the, the kind of simple definition at least of that is it's about being a little bit more kind of visual and a bit more intuitive of actually what that in, that information is telling you. So instead of just sending you a tabular report with you know you know hundred different cases from you know from a, a client um, and you know what's what's completed what hasn't um, been done is that the BI is starting to show it a bit more kind of visual um, dashboards are starting to be used. Um, uh, you know, to, to to show a little bit more um, of the kind of descriptive um, uh, and uh, and um, uh, kind of uh, areas of kind of themes and tunes, where obviously where we want to get to now is to start to kind of move into the analytics um, side, where we start to kind of go from that kind of um, uh, uh, you know predictive um, element to a prescriptive um, uh, element where. The uh, intelligence of the uh, analytics is starting to um, not only show what a trend has been, but also kind of start to predict what the trend will be you know, in, in the future and starting to, instead of giving lots of information all on the screen, is to actually start to um, uh, really refine the information and actually look at kind of key features or um, elements um, uh, you know, of what the report shows to, to really kind of help the, you know, the, um, the business user uh, make make better business decisions yeah and i think it's quite an interesting point and and you know for those that are in the data space that are on this uh, i know this this kind of journey of types of analytics will be quite uh, hopefully quite common and um, for those that join us from the legal industry that perhaps are thinking around this space looking at where they are this this might be relatively new but i i I think you're right. The descriptive is is tends to be what happened, and in business, it's everywhere. You know, the KPIs, the metrics we look at, tend to be very descriptive, very what happened. You know, um, how many cases were instructed in a month. You know, how many were closed. Which ones were so what's their settled status. You know, what's the current WIP. Um, elements like that. Um, I think obviously when you get to that BI space and you start to diagnose it, you start to bring contextual information together. You're looking at why that happened. That is intelligence, right? That is bringing out some contextual insights into the data. I think one interesting conversation we've had in the past and, and a journey point is what you pointed out there is that actually the delivery for a dashboard is 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 just the delivery method, right? It, it's not necessarily the insights or the intelligence itself. You can break the intelligence and insights down into different pieces of information, which can then be used differently across the business. And and I know you've spoken a lot in the past around the um, that integration back into the daily processes and into essentially data products that the business use, not necessarily dashboards. I think what you mentioned there around as we move to predictive analytics, so what might happen, looking at probability and in use cases, you know, for the legal industry, we're looking for detection and um, settlement agreements you know what what's the likelihood of someone accepting a particular settlement amount or what is the settlement amount that'll be the, the the trigger point rather than going through the legal process the full legal process and, and that when we get to that prescriptive piece around you know using ai putting in automation and actually delivering a what action to take um whether that be via automated action or suggested action um i, I think it needs to we need to think about alternative delivery methods uh, and quite often you talk about data products but does that does that change the 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 function of a legal firm? Does that change the the data team's responsibilities? How, can you tell us a little bit more around your concepts around data products and how a legal firm should deliver them? Well, well, um, and a data product can mean many you know, different things to many different people. I'm I'm specifically thinking more about in the, in the analytics and the output, um, you know, of of those data products and knowing where, you know knowing where they come from. So, does it affect? I mean, you say that does it affect the data team? In fact, actually, I'd say it, it should it shouldn't affect the data team. It should actually be affecting the business user, you know, whoever they are, the user of the data. And what we now need to be doing in the evolution of um, of being data driven is, you know, this isn't just the the world of 
you know, data analysts and engineers and everyone that's got kind of data in the title. And this is about using the data. So the data product um, will be something that data teams will be certainly responsible in in the creation of um, of those products. And then and that's that, that's not just the technology, but the data governance of that labeling, understanding what what the data is to produce something which is reliable for a business user to read and understand and then to make those you know, opinions of that i think again it's 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 producing something that is worthwhile i mean we are now living in a um, you know kind of world where visual data visualization is pretty much as good as I've, I've ever seen it. I mean, there's always been a lot of talk about dashboards and how they could um, uh, be produced, but they are certainly now, they look great. But in the same way as when you search something in kind of Google or any, or anything else and check GPTs, some, um, some we talked about, it can look very intelligent and you can always get an answer, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're getting the right answer because it's all based on the value of the data that it sits within it. So it's kind of it's the value of the data. So the product itself is something that should be usable and accessible not only to you know the, a data team and somebody that's um, you know helped and assisted in providing that, but it's the use of the business user. I think the, again the thing with the BI through to the intelligence and the insights. It, it, it's a bit like a kind of quick analogy. Hopefully, this will make some kind of sense. It's a bit like reading a newspaper. Yet you can have a newspaper without any, you know, headlines. The information's there, but you've got no information because you haven't got a headline. You need the headline to 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 kind of understand exactly at least what the purpose of all the text is. The other point of um, this is, and this is the AI and the analytics element, which provides the values, is actually having the commentary on the headline, which is the next part of it. So you can have all the same information, but there's different levels of information. One is just purely textual. It's just that's all the, all the facts. Next thing is there's a headline, which is a summary of that, but then you can have the opinion and the opinion is important. And that's the bit that if you provide a product and you have all the information for somebody that knows something about that business, they can start to be able to offer an opinion and actually add value to something that may have been automated to actually kind of produce that um, that that that, uh, that extra little bit of um, value to to the client. Interesting analogy, because uh, I know you say you've you've done a number of years in the legal industry, but uh, long and tooth in data. And, and you know, for those that haven't seen uh, Austin's background, there was a, as a background in, in print and, and media there as well. So um, uh, take so that analogy there. And it's, it's, it's an interesting point when you, you talk around that data product and it being the business value. Now, you know, legal firms are coming under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress to, to reduce costs to cut down those efficiencies. Um, we've already mentioned that they've got this huge burden around, you know, having to report to client MI because of the contractual obligations that, that they have. And so we can't ignore MI, um, but but to swift and, and change and, and switch into, you know, cloud being data driven, bringing all these modern things in, that, that's that's a huge investment. Um, and, and I know some of the bigger firms have done it, but for, for those that might be watching, maybe you're in a, a smaller, smaller organization, a smaller firm or an in-house team, how do you, how do you build value from that? How do you justify that kind of um, that investment to make that, that switch and that big change? Well, from from the perspective of um, of the law firm themselves, obviously they are <clears throat> predominantly client driven, um, and and a lot of what what's being done, and certainly in the firms we've seen, is obviously not every client is the same. Um, you know, one size does not fit all. There is no point coming up with something highly advanced and kind of cle clever in the way of data exchange if 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 your client can't cope with that. So you, you've always got to maintain and you want to maintain a service um, uh, to your client. So <clears throat> there is a number of different tracks which you know, I could see starting to kind of um, evolve um, now and it will be a kind of collaboration with with clients to provide, you know, to understand what that they want. The, any firm, you know, regardless of the industry, <sighs> We can come up with clever things, but obviously it's it, you've got to ass assess the value and whether anyone wants to buy what it is that you're what, what you're offering. So from the from the um, from this point of view, depending on the client and depending on what they want, some may simply want a data exchange and a, and a better and a faster and a swifter way of providing that data exchange because not necessarily every you know client, if they're a large client, may be advanced that they want the information themselves. 
and yeah, and that's when we start to kind of move into now certainly kind of multi-cloud kind of um, approaches where those, those secure data exchanges can kind of take place or fully automated um, or 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 at least semi-automated. The scary thing about that is what data is being sent to your client and have you reviewed that? So. <clears throat> The point of the analytics, there is the internal element of analytics about, you know, checking to make sure that, you know, the, the data that you're providing is um, uh, is of a good standard that your client expects and therefore you can send that out. That can be done internally. The other element of this, what value do you want to provide to a client? Because actually you can send do a data exchange, you know, to a, you know, to a client of, you know, God knows how many hundreds, thousands of rows of information. However, that one killer piece of information of do you realize, you know, what you know, your whip is currently standing at X? Did you realize that, you know, you know, of all of those cases, there, there's been a kind of consistent pattern in injuries occurring coming out of a certain location um you know that is something to look at so <clears throat> you have to be aware of why you're doing it and what what the purpose is there's no point just saying these things if you're no one's listening so the point with that is that to provide the value to make the investment is that you've got to kind of constantly be checking is this useful to the client don't i would certainly suggest that <laughs> With sometimes, and again, this kind of comes to the sort of to a dashboard. Some you know people can spend an awful lot of time crafting some wonderful, colourful looking dashboard, but when you give it to somebody else, they don't know what it means because it's just a lot of colourful pieces. Having that little insight that do you know if you did this and this, you're going to save yourself, you know, three percent on your kind of on your you know monthly spend. It's more important the value of that smaller piece of information, which is you know based and underlined by factual evidence if they ask well how do you know that and you can say well actually we've analyzed this amount of you know you know data we can also see an industry kind of trend going on here that, that you can provide the value so sometimes smaller more precise pieces of information is more valuable than sending everyone everything which i think if, if in this types of analytics we take the, the the predictive prescriptive ai automation labels out we're, we're saying what action to take right and I, I think what you've mentioned there is quite interesting because what you're saying is as legal firms we we are advisors and trusted advisors to our customers um and, and they use us because we give them the best ad advice around how to manage their risk right it's not necessarily we manage a lot of their legal processes the most efficiently or the the most automated route to keep the costs down in that sense is because of the guidance advice and approach that you take a, take as a legal firm that delivers them value so i feel it, it's an element of it could data products that provide risk exposure legal insights from that perspective could seem counterintuitive in terms of reducing the you know the number of cases you're going to going to be instructed on and, and take from there but i i think what you're saying is there's it adds to your value, adds to your your guidance and advice of the opinion that matters, and that's what the customers start to buy. They start to buy that that data driven opinion. Well, absolutely, and and to that point, again, if if, if you know certainly you know, specifically in the law firm, um, uh, legal firm, but you know in in any firm processing data is one thing that's just uh, and that's not a, that's not a specialism that's not a, that's not an advisory what what law firms have is obviously legal professionals that have spent a huge amount of time um uh, you know learning that what we are providing is providing them the tools and the raw materials i.e the data to be able to offer that up to provide the value and additional um, service so what we what the intention is is to make the huge amount of um you know legal opinion that's been curated over over years um from multiple different sources is to make that available so that the palette of a of a legal professional has more accessible information to them so that they can provide that better service and value to their, their to their to their clients but to to make sure that that is anchored in fact and 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 um uh, and and uh, precedent that can be identified so if a person is providing that value and saying well you know we believe this whatever that is that if they are then potentially challenged why do you think that that they can absolutely and you know they can say well this is because of this this and this so it's it's offering something which manually you know could take weeks and months for somebody to do that so it's the value of the delivery of it not the time that it takes to do it which is an interesting thing because certainly in the legal industry it's a time-based 
um, uh, you know, kind of industry to, to to a large degree, where what we're looking at more is providing the the value, and you know, what's the value if we can provide you something that's more valuable quicker? You know, how do you? Yeah, definitely uh, moving away from that that whip into more actually the the outcome based on, on that yes. side. Um, yeah. I, I want to. I want to move on slightly because I'm um, talking about, you know, data products and um, I know you're a huge fan uh, of Schmarzo. So, again, long in the tooth in data. Um, and, and I always find this an interesting conversation with yourself. Um, and when I go back to that question about it's great, you know, these tech companies, maybe not so much today, but uh, these tech companies have massive investment can drive these modern data platforms. You know, the finance industries are having to make these changes because of regulations um, for an industry that 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 traditionally is, you know, seen as as a slower mover that perhaps has to have those cost constraints that is, you know, very running at capacity because it's a time based uh, a kind of mentality and approach. How does Schmarzo's kind of economic digital asset theorem come into this idea of building data products and the value they get from them? Because I, I know that's something you've you've pushed quite heavily in uh, in in the, all the teams you've worked in. Yeah, well, absolutely, yeah, and uh, and it was it was something that was an instinct, and I think you know Bill um, kind of came up with this very succinctly and in a kind of uh, you know, um, in a mathematical uh, way where. In the enterprise um, uh, element, it's about you know bringing in all the elements from lots of different places. We have again a, a, a significant difference I see between a, a PLC and an LLP is that you have lots of different um, uh, businesses, you know, lots of different practice areas, um, you know, that all have similar but not exact same kind of challenges. So the benefit of um, econ you know the you know the um, uh, the economic um, valuation here is that. If as a firm you want to invest in something, no one practice area will necessarily um, uh, be able to support the investment in, to do that. So it's a kind of collaborative um, element of saying, right, well, OK, we've got to build a platform, a big kind of data platform. We want to go in cloud because every, you know, that's obviously that's where you know pretty much everyone is now going. So what you have um, have to do is there is a certain investment in the first place, but that 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 starts to flatten out because after you've built it, you've got it. What you can then start to do is that from all the different data sets that you have, if you all start to you know, populate and hydrate the same um, uh, environment, it doesn't have to be physically the same environment, but certainly the same managed environment, you can start to kind of increase your digital assets, i.e. Your, your pieces of um, data that can come from lots of different sources. Now, what you'll find is that that you've got that initial kind of cost and then you've got your use cases and you've got one or two use cases which you're purposely loading information in for those particular use cases. But then what will happen is that then the third, fourth use case requirement comes in. You'll, you'll start to um, notice that some of the data is already available, so therefore there's less effort to actually kind of create the next additional um, uh, products because then you've got the you know you've got that um, you only need to kind of get in one extra piece of data asset from um, a particular area, and you can already use what's there, and that's where you're starting to kind of create your kind of core data products um uh, you know those kind of key assets that, that you have where you're combining data from desperate um, data sources um to kind of have that kind of single view the acceleration element is after that you get to a kind of critical element where after you've got in a, a certain amount of um uh, data from different data sources the use use cases can start to um, uh, can start to um, accelerate purely by the fact that you're just seeing more more patterns, more um, options of there. So it's it, you know it's the economic value of after you've built it. The worst thing you can do is build it and then not use it because if you've just built it and just use it on one, or think okay, I'll do do the same thing somewhere else and not share it. And this is a big challenge with the um, the sharing of um, information. You have to be kind of aware of this. The, the kind of the key parts of this again, I'm slight um, bill um, on this and the ugly truth of data management is that to do all of this, you still need that good data management because you need to know where the data's come from. And certainly, when you're dealing with legal firms where you have client data as well, where you, where it's come from, what is it? how you can use it and where are you going to use it and as long as you've got those those kind of key elements put in this i think is an absolute you know kind of game changer and i think that's an interesting point you you raised it uh, towards the beginning of that point uh, or in that conversation there is that legal firms have a very traditionally you know bit of legal firms are are built up as you know partnerships they built up with multiple mergers and acquisitions uh, and quite often have different practice areas so unlike a lot of you know um 
private businesses, public businesses, where essentially they have one role that, you know, they've got to sell their products on, on the shelf. They've got to sell their, their services in, in one area. Uh, I think the legal industry poses this interesting data challenge around we've got different partners who all have their different prioritizations they have their different systems and actually they've got slightly different practices so it, it sounds and, and the advice here i guess is that if you focus on those core data products that are more commonly uh, could, or could be commonly used across the basis you've got to add a marginal amount on in order to accelerate the value that's gained from those and, and, and that's how the investment can't be on a project by project use case by use case basis it needs to be taken as an enterprise view or a wider view about what are we delivering and where's that value linking back to your other point of what's the value to our customers um uh, on that basis which I, I think is this this brings me into a point I, I know you've you've faced this challenge uh, previously um but if you've got all these mergers and acquisitions that creates quite a puzzle piece of um different case management systems you know there's many in in the industry there's many comp very complex ones they all work slightly differently how do you go about unpicking and, and and you know combining those data sets to create these these data products what's what's the kind of key to, to that puzzle well, I think after you've gone, you know, right, so a platform, a kind of common area to work, some some certain tools are, you know, kind of software technical tools are available, lots of um, tools are available. The main, uh, the big thing about this is uh, quickly and, and as fast as possible getting involved with the, the, the subject matter experts of the data. As a head of data, I'm, I've always been kind of keen to point out that there's very little data that I own, not much data, if any, apart from my own personal kind of, you know, kind of PII um, data is actually owned by myself. So the quickest thing to do is to establish some form of, you know, data management stewardship with, with the owners of the data. You are absolutely right that when when firms come in, and it's not a unique thing to, um, to law firms because it, it happens in other firms where, with the merger acquisitions is, a lot of the times the, it's the same data, but it's got slightly different names. The quickest way to do that is engage with the people that use that data, um, that, 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 that data and identify and start to kind of establish like a, you know, a data glossary where ev everyone agrees that oh, perfect timing, um, you know, agrees the, um, uh, you know, the terms for those critical data assets. Certainly one thing that, I, again, I recognise the distinction between maybe kind of legal and finance from a data shape is that in financial um, uh, data, obviously a lot of it's numeric and it's it's long, long and thin. In legal, what you tend to have is kind of short and fat, not so many records, not hundreds, you know, not the millions of you know, trade and transaction data that you have from uh, maybe a financial in institution. But what you have is a lot more kind of quality data, which which is wider, not as much. The volume may not be as much, but you have you know a wider um, selection of text um, fields. So what you need to do, and uh, you know this this particular um, screen kind of simplifies what is very complex um, area. But the point being is that what are the similarities with what you're talking about in this particular um, uh, case, case management? You know, what most, there's going to be a case number, a case reference or something. So what is it called? And it may be called something physically different in different systems, but you should have that. Chances, you know, there's going to be an open date, there's going to be a closed date, you know, a date of in, uh, instruction, some other kind of key similar um, uh, um, uh, uh, elements, which are always consistent. That is really useful to have because that's where your master data management uh, 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 models start to kind of come out from. That also then is um, the basis of any kind of products that you start to create because you have consistency. With all of these ones, there will always be a huge amount of specific client data um, uh, that, that is that may or may not be useful, but what should be kind of borne in mind is that there's no point trying to, again, not to paraphrase too many cliches, don't boil the ocean. You don't have to kind of get a glossary term for every single piece of information that you have in a case management system, but you should certainly be kind of recognising those kind of core elements to bring in that kind of core, which is then what you can create your master data management models, which then means that you can start to um, uh, produce multiple different data products. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point because um, certainly through my experience with, with legal firms, there's each partnership, each each uh, kind of practice area feels that the, there's a uniqueness around what, what they do and what they deliver and how they process and the, date, the amount of data they 
have to collect in order to meet client obligations and client MI, um, the the types of insights they might want to drive and what data is required for for that. Um, I, I think. I, I go back to this point around, like you said, the trusted advisors and, you know, who has more um, who has more data and more information and knowledge around this area than 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 others. Um, I, I, and if I go all the way back to, to my recruitment kind of career at the beginning, the very first training session I had, um, the, the trainer said, you know, if you're talking about speaking to interview processes, who organizes and arranges more interview processes, the hiring manager or the recruiter that works, you know, for, for 20, 20 different customers over, over, you know, number of years. Um, so that experience and knowledge you gain is, is relevant. So I, I put that in the legal case firm is who knows more about managing legal cases and, and case management, the legal firm who deals with, you know, hundreds of thousands or thousands of, of cases each each month or the the client who handles you know a few that there are a few hundred that they need to deal with um so i think you're right if you can focus on regardless of the practice areas regardless of the 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 different systems we use across the organization can we start by establishing a common data model or a common data set that that help us and support us in answering the business questions we have that deliver our client value take from there i, I think the important part you mentioned there is it needs to be business owned you know the data team don't own it the technical team don't own it the, the engineering team don't own it the, the people that own this to make the decision is the business um and going to the, you know the the finance space is an interesting one for that you know how do you kind of get people to to understand they own it well if the data team decided that VAT was 1.5 and times all the numbers to 1.5 to do the calculation I'm sure there'll be a lot of complaints um, so I, I think it's that's a really kind of good analogy about who owns the data and and how do you start to to unpick some of those complexities the and other I think just, 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 oh, oh, sorry, sorry I didn't mean to cut across yeah, you no, one no, thing I certainly would say. And, and it's the thing that needs to be always be kind of made clear is it's owning the data, not the system where the data um, lives, because data is fungible. Uh, and again, you, you mentioned, obviously, because I mentioned it, finance, finance and HR, the data moves. A lot of the time data, people data moves in between systems just because it's in a system doesn't mean you own it, which is and this is the whole kind of process management um, element, which is why you need to have ownership, uh, you know, glossary um, terms agree, because it's 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 in, important for it to be effective is that the people that you know understand the difference between a system owner and a data owner because and what what and the life um cycle of the data itself as well which is a, obviously another kind of critical element of this i think one of the the things that i've found interesting from a legal perspective in terms of uh, against other industries that we work in is when we come to the concept of granularity um i think that you know in, in a business you can have different systems that measure things in different granularities but because you've got one business one one you know essentially one practice area to, to handle with in a normal business it's easy to establish that granularity line of what's needed i, I think one of the things that's unique to legal firms is that your different practice areas may deal with different granularity so you know uh, a, a car insurance or car kind of claims may have multiple defendants you might build dealing with you know um larger case law where there's there's multiple claimants you know um whereas in some other kind of practice areas it's a kind of one-to-one -one relationship um and i know the systems deal that with differently but i think that's something unique that i've seen in something like the legal firm where it's not just the systems the granularity that's different but the actual processes are different that that's that creates quite a complexity when it comes to the glossary and how do you how do you start to handle that how do you start to to unpick that very good question um and i mean it's asking the questions again it's it's always critical to understand the business area you have there is there is a certain kind of approach and uh, to, to to managing data uh, as you said with your kind of recruitment days and having a framework on how we how we do this establishing kind of those kind of data management stewards um, you know call it what what you want understanding what it is invariably means that it's best to start to um these you know be, before people rush off kind of creating new kind of data warehouses or m models is actually understanding what 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 the actual kind of details of that of what it is and actually understand what's different about the process from from this from what the current process is if you start to kind of create certain models and processes 
it's always useful to start with looking at those ones and then start to establish what it what 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 is it about them that doesn't work as opposed to saying oh well we've just got to create a new model because if you just kind of start start saying well we've got to create a new process because it's a new practice area you'll just end up with this um, proliferation of um, of very similar work streams and workflows which are almost the same um, but with differences that you don't know about so if you kind of start with the kind of core basics of those and then start to understand what the, um, the kind of derivative off um, shoots of of that um, uh, that that um, process or, or 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 area is then you can start to kind of almost going to kind of create kind of degrees of difference variant from from the kind of core, which then allows hopefully and the intention is obviously to to allow for that consistency um, of, of the data, which again then starts to turn around into actually providing the value because if you can understand what the a kind of core element of how something works then start to uh, understand the differences of that that's when you start to find out those nuances because yes absolutely in the legal firm the difference between how something works in healthcare to aviation to construction to kind of you know kind of casualty are intrinsically different you would absolutely get the wrong value it, um, and give the wrong answer if you just try to do a one size fits all but there is a huge amount of consistency with all of those because it's yeah you know, in this particular case we're talking about the practice of law so therefore there is some fairly good kind of um framework that is uh, that's that's um that it's um worked around so so again it's I, I don't think any of this gets done in isolation the platform the setting up of teams getting specialists is key but um it is it is lost if you don't in, engage with the, the the subject matter experts of of a um, uh, of, of a business, it's the whole kind of thing about the CDO where they report. You know, what is it? Is it an IT function or is it a business function? I'm in the business function um, uh, camp where it's it's critical to operate within the business um, uh, to provide that value. Uh, look, I, I think that's an interesting point. And we, as we've moved through, you know, this conversation, um, thinking about the <clears throat> the point around this this you know MIBI and getting to that insights and analytics that how does that deliver value for the customers you know what are the complexities and what are the first parts to, to start to unpick that and it, it seems that a lot of legal firms have have this challenge around these case management systems the complexities of them but and having this partnership model where you've got multiple prioritizations you've got multiple different ways of practicing you know the the, the firm uh, the the law and the ways of different processing the the same kind of uh, approaches so it the data management, it sounds like it's a huge part of that, but actually business ownership and, and talking to the business, engaging the business um, and finding that commonality, it, it sounds like it's a good point to that. Obviously, there's been a huge increase in, um, as we said earlier, AI, you know, data science, machine learning capabilities. Um, obviously, a couple of the big law firms now have a few kind of products that have been released over the last kind of 12 months that aim to use these AI tools to deliver value to customers and actually deliver a lot of, you know, internal efficiencies as well. Um, I, I think we, we talked about uh, in, a, in a blog the other week about Robin AI coming through and, and providing this kind of um, contract negotiator AI tool um, that they've just got a massive investment for. Um, what, what, what do you see some of the key analytical use cases? Uh, and if there are people on the call that have you know, started this journey, maybe they've got a bit of a handle on their data management, bit of a handle around getting some, some BI into their businesses, want to be pushing that boundary, want to be innovating. Where can they start? What, what kind of use cases should we be looking at in a legal firm? Well, I think, I, I think to start, it's, it's best to try and kind of control your vari variables that much. So I, I certainly wouldn't suggest just pushing something out directly to the um, client straight away I think you need to start operational efficiency is a is a potentially kind of from a kind of maturity scale um, point of view um, establishing operational efficiency um, is is a very good and um, helpful um, uh, ele element to start to work on because you can control it you can see what the results are um, uh, when we're talking about AI and uh, there's there's lots of kind of talk about using AI um, uh, for um, data governance and classification and things like that so actually starting to review and, um, and put pointing your AI um, at your internal processes 
both business kind of service HR finance things and practice um, uh, services as well is a good um, start to, to understand and to kind of start to kind of create the kind of culture of how to ask questions and how to look at that uh, but it is a kind of a Kind of, it's that it's one of those kind of hockey stick kind of growth um, elements where we can start with um, uh, those areas to understand that from internal you can start to look at your you know your trusted providers. There may be again um, a lot a lot of the times you know partnerships are formed with other people exchanging data um, uh, both internally for uh, you know, office entry type um, uh, in, information through to um, uh, you know kind of uh, uh, enhanced. Um, um, uh, um, HR um, elements you can start to work with to provide value to internal suppliers. From there, you can then start to really kind of move into the kind of legal delivery and start to work into your products and services, which start to go onto your kind of client, your client facing um, elements as, as, as shown there. So I think that there is a, there's an evolution step where you can start to build out on that and it kind of goes back to that whole kind of the, the economics of data itself but it, it's also the, eco the economics of establishing that, that data um uh, maturity in its in itself where the firms will start to learn how to do things and the process of doing things and then start to be kind of able to evolve that so not only are you evolving your data sets and increasing your data volumes but you're also increasing your maturity of a, of, of a firm and moving out from being purely the data team with the only people that deal with the data to the fact that everyone's you know responsible for their data and providing those values so i think there's an evolutionary element i mean the 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 ai just needs to be used with caution. It's a bit uh, again. I've, you know, I've used the the term before. AI and machine learning. It's 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 the equivalent of a power tool. You can do something, you know, kind of slowly um, uh, with with a manual um, drill, or you can make an awful lot of a mess um, with a power drill very very kind of quickly. Um, you need experience and ability to use um, sometimes the um, the automation and the power tools. Um, and I would certainly use, you know, a, a lot of um, kind of caution. And making sure that people are equipped to use the um, the automation um, and you know AI and uh, again I tend to prefer the assisted intelligence as opposed to the um, uh, artificial intelligence. I think everything needs to be looked at um, and will need to be looked at, especially when it comes to law, um, for a long time before anyone starts assuming that it's um, it's it's you know fit fit for purpose. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think that the um, and the power tools analogy is a key one. And if we go back to what you said earlier about legal professions are, you know, it, it's an advisory role. It's a, a trust advisors. It's about guidance. It's about, you know, um, giving given support and advice in those areas. Uh, I think that means that a lot of customers, the value you're providing them is reputational. And I, I think that it comes with it a lot of reputational risk and your reputation is kind of what sells as a legal firm rather than, you know, your physical products that you would as a, as a retail store or, or you know, um, outcomes of a, of a consultancy uh, based business and stuff like that. So I, I think because it's built on that reputation and that trust element that Ultimately, the more client facing your your AI and data science use cases go, the higher the risk um, to, 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 like you said, power tool. You can break bring down half the wall with with the drill, you know, if, you, if you're drilling in the wrong place or you use it incorrectly. So, um, yeah, I do see that that uh, that point there. Maybe that's why, you know, we've had this caution and, and maybe that's why a lot of the AI tools that are seen to be emerging into the legal industry and legal tech at the moment are more operational focused or moving into that legal delivery space that they're still internal you know like we said a, a, you know a brief creation uh, i know lexus nexus have have got a, a kind of new brief writer as, as part of one of their toolkits um you know when you're looking at contract creation like robin ai you know this idea around document reviews um and this that which which brings me on to an interesting point around the the role of data science and um i suppose the the use cases that for me are not necessarily unique but but quite um quite relevant to the legal industry in comparison to others i think in a lot of other industries we talk about you know structured and unstructured data um we talk about you know, document being semi-structured in, in that sense and you know there's people that say oh most businesses you go into 95 percent of the data is structured I, I think with experiences of legal firms the one of the elements they have is actually there's a lot of 
unstructured data, right? There's a lot of kind of um, uh, depositions. There's a lot of kind of notes. There's a lot of kind of different documents that you can't really describe as semi-structured because they're coming from third parties, lots of different suppliers. If I go back to something like, you know, um, go back to something like legal insurance claims and or, or, or those kind of bits in, in a car industry, you can't. The valuation that gets done might be a handwritten valuation report, or even if it is digitalized, it might come from a third party. And the different third parties you'll use will have different forms. So it's very hard to start to structure those documents. Um, and if you look at, you know, case case law and, and precedents, you know, it's not always going to be in the same format, in the same approach. The journals, yes, they look very similar, but they're very text heavy. So I, I think one of the interesting roles for data science in, in legal firms is to handle that unstructured and semi-structured data and, and unpick that knowledge um, and, and I think that's something unique to to or some unique to the legal profession that other industries don't see um, how does that how does that create a, an opportunity uh, and what challenges does that bring I think it, it's a huge opportunity um, <clears throat> with, with that the, the you're, you're right I think that you know unstructured document um, is is a huge amount of what certainly in kind of um, law firms as opposed to the structured information and I know we've obviously predominantly been talking about the kind of you know case management but the documentation um, uh, it, that's held in you know document management systems uh, is, is huge and generally greatly un underused based on what we could do with it now it's been used and everyone's effectively um, doing it and everyone I'm, I'm sure you know you know all you know kind of legal profession uh, are you know properly kind of filing their information and uh, and categorizing it and classifying it um, as it should be however you know the 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 the, the gold the value is actually in the sentiment um of, of a lot of that documentation you have got a number of different um as you say kind of types of documents each law firm itself has its own uniqueness held within its document management systems um, and, and the lawyers that provide that information and when people talk of, yeah, and again there's lots of um, uh, um, research on this about you know, data driven what is data driven and you know huge large percentage of firms still use gut instinct to um, uh, you know to kind of drive their their business decisions gut instincts is based on you know a huge amount of experience that you know that a lot of these people have got over the years some of that gut instinct is probably hidden within the documents that they've got because it's about those those kind of discussions and arguments and uh, and thoughts that they've got and it's all within that uh, in there how we we are starting to see evidence of you know being able to use ai and um, and the you know natural language to start to be able to you know under understand you know what the meaning of something actually is in the wording that's used within that so the potential is if we can kind of tap into a controlled data set which is every single you know law for every company but every single law firm has its own unique set of data which isn't available on google for people to play around with if you've if you've spent a lot huge amount of time uh, you know, in a in a profession and you have all that valuation, the opportunity to have that information summarised and suggested back to you, I think, has a massive um, of, um, um, uh, value for the people that use that. But again, it's the people that use it now. This is not about replacing um, uh, the people that are the professionals of doing this. This is about making that data available instead of thinking. I seem to vaguely remember something happening a few years ago and I'll scratch around looking in my outlook now for that email and that kind of discussion and why do I think that that in fact we can start now start to get that kind of sentiment analysis done through reading the um, through reading documentation with aided by the classifications that are already held within those um, document management systems can really start to provide that assisted intelligence to that it still needs to be read by the person that provides it I certainly wouldn't want to see anyone firing out um, anything um, uh, you know purely automated um, uh, on, from pride with their legal advice but to have that information is easily available readily available to professional um, uh, you know services um, I think really just provides an ability to provide more insight it's just providing a dish a, a whole you know bag of power tools to to a, to a legal professional which they haven't got they still do still doing the same thing they've just got their they are now going to start having some tools to be able to you know build better stronger more convincing more compelling um, you know kind of opinion and guidance.
and, and uh, you can give a, a maybe a sh- maybe this is a sh- yes no answer but um taking that it sounds like you're you're suggesting that all this talk around you know the likes of chat gbt and and out outside AI tools um, that you can integrate and start to use with your own products. Um, you, you're suggesting that actually, the yes, while there's value in them, the real value is internal. And if we go back to that point around a legal firm being an advice business, being, you know, being about trusted advisors, um, that, you know, anyone could use ChatGBT to to find a president search of, you know, previous case law about a particular subject and, and take from there. But what what that's missing is is the internal opinions, advice, and guidance and knowledge from those years of practice, those years of cases of every fee earner that that's kind of walked through the the doors of, of the firm. Um, so, so you're saying that legal businesses, despite the fact that you know data science, machine learning is not their core, you know, their core functionality, that they need to start tapping into that internal knowledge. Absolutely, yeah, and I think, yeah, I mean. I, I, quickest analogy i guess is it's a bit like having the ingredients or or, or an ability to you know, do without the it's without having the core ingredients the core ingredients are the is the data the process of how you process that data to create something else you know bake a cake whatever you can have the, you can have the ingredients you know an ai model that says well if you do the, if you add this this and this then you'll you'll get a cake what, i mean i guess this is you know simplicity uh, the, the same kind of thing that if you've got that it, you, you need the ingredients to produce that because if you haven't got the ingredients you can't actually produce the product that you're looking for and then it's a matter of quality because you, there is there is a different level of quality that you can provide to something sometimes it's volume not always i'll say you're certainly kind of google's got lots of volume quality not so great opinions you do not want the opinions of somebody that's had a fallout with their with their neighbor about something kind of you know kind of you know kind of get you know kind of um, um, a skewering an, a, an opinion but you've got the quality of data there so there's a huge rich raw ish quality of data that now what we've got now is that there are these you know models where if you put them on that model you would not get the same result if all of the models the certainly the market mod- models again chat gpt happens to be the flavor of the month at this moment of time you would not get the same response if you use the same model in the different law firms because if if it's you know based on their own ingredients um then it's down to the power and the uh, and the validity of that um, organization to make the make the most of that so absolutely the kind of data is the key ingredient um to to the automation of this which brings me back to the point you say around, um, you know, you talk with there a lot about the, the quality of the data, which comes back to that point around data management and, and really kind of pushing those case management uh, systems and, and stuff like that. And we've, we've got five minutes left, and I just want to open the uh, open the floor in a moment to to Q and A and see if there's any kind of questions from from those that have been able to join us live. Um, but certainly from a uh, an ethics point of view, um, data ethics, you know, is is coming more and more into the light as we start to look at these AI models. It sounds like you've you've tapped onto a point there around the opinions of others and, and the quality of the data and what gets you into these kind of external models comes through. Surely we need to think about the biases and think about the internal um, you know, biases of our own data as, as it's built up, as, as the law has changed over time, what we're feeding into those models. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, it's ethics, and also, again, lest we forget, certainly, uh, you know, it's it, it's the validity of the data and whose data it actually is, and and, and client data versus our own um, data needs to be considered. So it's an ethic and a governance um, uh, um, point there. Yes, obviously, um, we, we you know biases um, can can be seen in there. Um, again, it's it's the individuals. It's the source and the agreement of of common data sources, not only within the own uh, own firm, but maybe also within the legal industry itself. When we're talking about this, certainly again in finance, you have shared data sources of certain um, elements, which every you know every firm can have there have now. Doesn't necessarily mean it's guaranteed, but again, there's a kind of collective element here of share certain data, not everything, obviously, you know, notwithstanding kind of you know PII and everything else um, that, in, that that entails in there. Considering the sharing of core elements within a, a core um, professional area, 
when appropriate, should absolutely um, uh, could certainly be considered because again, it could it could improve the uh, the value of that professional service, whichever professional service that is. So it it you know, ex ethics in the, in its own is about kind of do, you know doing the right thing even if you're not told to do it. I mean, it's it's that whole that it's the nuance of that. It's not about following the letter of the law because obviously you can follow the letter of the law and it may not be necessarily still considered to be ethical. So again, that needs to be a self-aware uh, um, element. You can't you can't build in what you can try to build in automate automated ethics. But I think, but by its very nature, ethics is still um, very much a human thing. So I think, and again, I'm just leading into that, uh, is, uh, is that yeah, having a human in the loop, as you've um, said there, I think is a kind of critical element to that. Yeah, and, and look, I, I, it, uh, I suppose, like I said, this we want. I wanted the discussion to be a fireside, but but really guided by some of the points that I know you've you've kind of raised and and that we've had discussions over the years around um, as you've gone through this journey um, and, and actually you know, we've looked at the industry from that side. So yeah, I guess for me I agree. You know, this human in the loop point it needs to. So we really we need the AI and data science to integrate into our day to day systems so they get used. It's not just about dashboards. Insights is about delivering actions, delivering information, but we still need to make this work alongside the knowledge advantage we have internally and the risk factors that we're willing to the thresholds that always change and we, we kind of make guidance on as, as humans so I think for now you're right there's that caution as you bring it into an organization keeping the human in the loop um, until we have that maturity and and, and take from there uh, look I'd like to thank you Austin for your time and and for your your insights into this uh, I'm sure you know there's people in the legal industry that are at different ends of the spectrum some you know that have kind of got ahead and, and 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 pushing AI and innovating in the organizations others that maybe starting out in their journey and still kind of doing a lot of manual MI reporting and, and want to kind of make those few steps and I hope today's insights can help them in in where to go next and what to do um I will you know we'll we'll keep the the session open for a few more minutes in case there's any Q&A from those that have joined us live but for everyone else thank you for listening thank you for watching um and hopefully this is uh provided some some insights and if you do have any other questions or want to talk to us that uh, value framework which is a, an additional slide that takes from there but these are the kind of seven areas that we talk about um throughout a data transformation um area to try and drive that data value in the organization um on those sides uh, but yeah if you want to get in touch with with Eden Smith at any time I'll keep the contact details up while while we open the floor to Q&A